What is essential liberty? To me, it's the freedom to speak your mind. It's the freedom to speak your mind. Uh, because by speaking your mind, you guarantee yourselves all the other freedoms. If you have the right, as the slaves were demanding, to argue for your freedom, then you will eventually win if the truth is on your side. And you will eventually claim the rights that are owed to you by a society that believes that everybody's equal. You can advance and progress through freedom of speech. That's why I call it the cornerstone, because it's the founding principle. Right? And if you don't have that, you don't have everything else. Freedom of speech and the things that come with it is the reason that the West has been so successful. Because people since the Enlightenment have been, been able to pursue science, study, exploration, because of it. And that is why the West is as successful as it is. And it's a guarantee of our strength. It's a guarantee of our competitive success. It's a guarantee of um, our economic success. It's a guarantee of everything. That's why it's essential liberty. One of the things that strikes me as interesting about the current debate, I take your point there, but is that many of the people who are now exposing the absurdity of the position we find ourselves in, which has been driven largely by self-proclaimed progressive members of the left, is that it's people from the left who have been very quick when they're honest to show the dangers. So you stop and think of some, com uh, some comedians who would hardly be conservative, I suspect. I don't mean them any uh, you know, ill will at all in saying that, but people who are well known in Australia too, Rowan Atkinson, Stephen Fry, John Cleese, Bill Maher, They've all attacked this emerging humorlessness, particularly by the progressive left. What's going on there? Well, we see it coming. Mm. It's a fundamental threat to what we do. It's the left critiquing the left often. But, but my point is those people... They understand they, it because... Because they're comedians or yeah. because they come from that background. They recognise that without the freedom to explore ideas, and sometimes, by the way, John, to cross the line, this is something that people forget, is we're human beings, all of us. And if you have a culture where you make one mistake and you're done, one mistake yeah. and you're done forever, yeah. that's not going to work. This is part of this sort of unbelievably pompous self-righteousness mm. that now accompanies the idea that we're each the centre, as you say, of the universe. Um, uh, that we uh, we just can't cope with the idea that somebody shouldn't have something they said 15 or 20 years ago held against them. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in this, in this city makes the point that the washing out of forgiveness, that great Judeo-Christian demand that we be prepared to forgive. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how a relationship works if you can't forgive. How does a marriage relationship work? If, I have no idea. Because you're going to do the wrong thing from time to time. And you've got to be reflective enough to say, when your spouse says to you, you, you know, you've done the wrong thing, to say, well, I better think that through. Perhaps I have. And then apologise. I mean, and the most... then be forgiven. And then to be forgiven. But it's, it's a really important concept. I don't see how a family, a community, a society can work if you wash forgiveness out. But now we've made it worse because we can't forget. Everything's been recorded by social media. So... If forgiveness is gone, then perhaps you've got the hope that people might forget, well, that's gone as well now. Yeah. That's why forgiveness is probably the crucial thing right now because, as you say, things can't be forgotten. But also, uh, you touched on religion, and I'm someone who's not, I'm a non-believer. But I can't help but think that what we've created as a society when we killed God is the, a vacuum that inevitably has to be filled. And when it gets filled, it gets filled by a new religion, which is what social justice and intersectionality and all of that now is. They have priests, they have inquisitions. The only thing they don't have in that religion is redemption and forgiveness. Right. And that is a pretty horrible religion. Can you imagine a religion with no forgiveness and redemption? where you stray once and you are forever tormented in hell or in living hell, it, it, it's not going to work. It, it's not sustainable. Um, and 
forgiveness is, is the crucial thing, which is why I'm always encouraged when I see politicians. You know, Andrew Yang, I see him trying to introduce some of that. There was a, a guy who said some racist things on a podcast who got hired for a comedy program and then got fired. And he, Andrew Yang came out and the, it was racism about Chinese people and said, well, I forgive him. You know, people make mistakes. That's reassuring to me. We need more of that. But it's got to be a shift that happens at the level of society. If we don't have forgiveness, I don't, I don't understand how this world is going to work. No, I honestly I, I, don't. I, I absolutely concur with you. I really do. I think it's an incredibly important uh, uh, matter that we're only now starting to think about. If we can't forgive, we can't move on. What's more, we rob our society of many good and capable people who are judged for something they said in a moment of anger or a lapse of judgment 20 or 30 years before. That's absurd. The other absurdity is that it locks us into a view that you can't grow. You can't become an adult. And I notice now that we seem to think, well, adults have made a complete mess of the world and we ought to hand it over to the children. Mm. Some academics have been putting forward the idea that we ought to give children as young as six the vote. Because six. they're obviously wiser than adults who have ruined <laughs> everything. So, uh, you know, we've, we've gone mad.